I'm the executive director for the Scott Institute for Energy Innovation. Um, I am joined by my esteemed colleague, uh, Jay Whitaker. Um, Cody is behind the camera, Amanda over here on the side, and there are a few others uh, roaming around. Welcome to the first of several uh, distinguished lectures that are happening this spring. We're so glad to have you here. Um, as I mentioned, it's a very crowded house, so please do um, sit in these chairs. There are a few up here, uh, so make sure you fill in all the chairs. Um, just to make sure that we, uh, of course we're not going to have an emergency, Sorry. Uh, but just in case we do, I do want to remind you that you are on the fifth floor. This is the ground floor, so if there were an emergency, you would actually exit this door in the back um, and head out to campus, which is off of this floor. Um, the restrooms, if you need them, the men's is in this corner of the building and the women's is on that side. Please help yourself to the food, um, hoping that you uh, enjoy what we brought in today. So there are a couple of events that I'd like to uh, announce for you. Um, the first is Nick Muller, who is a Scott Fellow, is going to be speaking tomorrow in partnership with Metro 21. Uh, it's a lunch and learn. Um, he's going to be talking about an index for economic and environmental performance methods with an application to Pittsburgh. Um, in this room on January 24th, and Rel's Tony Markle will be speaking on um, secure and efficient energy systems. On February 19th, the new director for the National Energy Technology Lab, NETL, is going to be here, Brian Anderson. He'll be talking about the future of the lab and the research that they do. Um, on February 26th, Clean Tech Open North West, Northeast director Beth Zonis is going to be talking about startups in the energy and clean tech sectors. And finally, of course, a reminder for Energy Week which is the last week in March this year. Registration remains free. It's four days of programming, and there's a tremendous amount of information available online, and registration will open in early February. So without further ado, after those announcements, I'd like to introduce our two guests this morning. I'm so glad that you're here. So Dr. Carl Husker is a senior fellow in the World Resources Institute Energy and Climate Programs, and a senior fellow at the Climate Center for Energy Policy at the University of Pennsylvania. He leads analysis and modeling of climate mitigation, electricity market design, and social cost of carbon. He led the risky business study of clean energy scenarios for the United States and lectures widely on deep decarbonization. He's worked for three decades in the fields of climate change, energy and environment, and a career that has spanned legislative and executive branches, research institutions, NGOs, and consulting. He's led climate policy analysis and modeling projects for USAID, US EPA, uh, REGI, the Western Climate Initiative, and the California Air Resources Board. Much of his work is focused on the um, energy and transportation sectors and on low carbon, uh, climate resilient development strategies. So thank you, Carl. Uh, Katie McGinty is a veteran policymaker, recognized environmental leader, and advocate for her common sense environmental solutions. In her role as Senior Vice President for the Oceans Program, she leads a global team of scientists, lawyers, and advocates working to create thriving and resilient oceans. McGinty, who served as the Deputy Assistant to the President and Chair of the White House Council on Environmental Quality, has deep expertise coordinating environmental policy while working with stakeholders on all sides to ensure the best possible outcomes for the environment and the economy. After serving as Secretary of the Environmental Protection, under Pennsylvania Governor Rendell, McGinty went on to build a strong career in the private sector focused on developing sustainability solutions. Her achievements include leading a $100 million business designing microgrids and remediating and re redeveloping Granville properties. We're also happy that she is on the Board of Advisors for the Scott Institute. Um, an interesting note uh, and a connection point, obviously, is that these two are married. <laughs> They've been, they met 29 years ago at a Clean Air Act briefing for the U.S. Senate. They have three daughters, Elena, Tara, and Allie, and they reside in Westchester County, Pennsylvania. So, power couple indeed. <laughs> so, <laughs> nice to have you here. Jay Whitaker is going to be moderating our panel this morning. So. Great, thank you all for coming out for this exciting event. Uh, as Anna said, it's the first of uh, a number of ones we're going to have this semester. It's great to see this kind of turnout, especially the first week of classes, so this is uh, a perfect kickoff. 
I, I don't want to waste any more time. Uh, I believe Katie's going to speak first. Uh, and here's the format. Uh, they're each going to give uh, their sort of rendition on uh, what was posted on the uh, inv uh, on description of the event and, and what you see uh, on Carl's first slide. Uh, Katie is just going to speak extemporaneously. Carl has a handful of slides. This is going to go about a half an hour or so. Um, and then we're going to have sort of a fireside chat. My, my job is to sort of direct traffic. I would love to source most of the questions and discourse from you. Um, I will, of course, have my own set of questions as well. But let's just see how this goes. The idea is to really sort of uh, have them set the stage and then pick three or four things to have a, a deeper topical dive on. So without further ado, Katie, please. There we go. Whoa. <laughs> hello, hello. So I know you're all, all choked up out there. As you heard that romantic story about meeting at a Clean Air Act briefing. <laughs> now that's something you want to reenact every year on your anniversary. <laughs> it is great to be back in the Berg uh, and here in particular, this fine institution. Um, I also, uh, as we uh, uh, gather today to talk about where innovation can help unlock tough problems, uh, want to say on behalf of all of my colleagues at the Environmental Defense Fund who were here last week, another chapter in great progress and innovation as we were thrilled to help recognize and usher in both the governor's uh, forward-looking climate change commitments in his executive order as well as our friend Morgan O'Brien and People's Gas taking a uh, really nation-leading initiative in terms of cutting emis fugitive emissions from their infrastructure. So there you go, P Pittsburgh on the cutting edge once again. All right, well, I'm going to give you the secret magical formula that my brilliant remarks will be leading to. And I'm not going to make you wait for it. I'm going to share it with you right off the top. So here's the magic formula. Science, economics, and participatory decision making. Say that last one with a little peanut butter in your mouth. <laughs> All right, so it is a formula. And it is a formula that, in my humble opinion, would make some good fodder for almost any exercise in public policy. But it's a magic formula for me, that science plus economics plus participatory decision making, because it has helped me, <laughs> through thick and thin on a number of occasions, change what looks like the political, politically impossible to a significant environmental win. Unpacking it a little bit, so the science piece, to me, two parts. One, the being serious about the science so you get the problem statement right to start with. Define the problem. But the second part of the science is the technology side, which I'm thinking some folks in this room might know a little bit about. What are the technologies that might be relevant that could possibly open up a broader universe of solutions to said problem? So that's the first piece. The economics. Call me crazy, but I think there are environmental solutions that not only optimize and solve for upside for the environment, but optimize and solve for upside for the economy. Design the tools so it achieves both. And third, the participatory decision-making piece. Well, when you're one of 10 kids, <laughs> you learn like you work it out <laughs> in the scrum. But mostly right now, little message to 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. America happens to be a democracy, not a dictatorship. Openness, transparency, inclusion, and decision-making. So that's the formula. All right, examples of where this particular formula may have saved my bacon. I mean, brought about good environmental progress. First example, renewable energy in Pennsylvania. So here's the scene. The scene is 2003. And for the young faces in this room, nobody was really doing renewables in 2003. So what happens? Well, this force of a brash new environment secretary comes rolling out of Washington, D.C. into the hallowed, hallowed 
conservative halls of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Well, a little bit of nervousness because this particular environmental secretary was not just gasp coming from Washington, but rolling out of gasp Bill Clinton's White House. And if all of that wasn't scary enough for the Harrisburgers, before that, this particular secretary serving all of those years uh, as Al Gore's apprentice. Yikes. So sensing this nervousness upon my arrival, of course, I did the sensible thing. Amp it up and proceeded to declare a big vision and goal that Pennsylvania can, would, and should lead the country in wind and solar. Well, the gasps were like visible. We're the fifth largest coal producing state in the country. What's this wind and solar business? Come to the rescue, this magic formula, the science, the economics, the participatory decision making. So the science in some parts, in a, it, from a high level perspective, self-evident. Climate is a crisis that needs to be solved. But what about that other piece of the science part of the equation, the piece that says, are there technologies out there that we just aren't seeing, haven't looked for, that maybe <laughs> instead of pushing people away or just building opponents and enemies to the initiative, might open the doors, bring new ideas in. Convinced that there had to be some out there, off I go from the science part of the formula to the participatory decision making part. Now just picture the vibe in the room when this Northeast Philly gal sits down with the coal guys. It was an animated discussion. But investing in those relationships, building them up, dialing down the distrust, listen, learn. And I learned stuff about things like waste coal plants. Electron by electron, much cleaner than a conventional coal plant. And I learned things about IGCC. And I learned things like, uh, about PFBC. There are options. There are options. Are they, any of them the solution? No. But did they move the needle environmentally? Yeah. Well, let's take that back. What do we do with that? I got to maintain the integrity of my big vision, we're going to lead on renewables. Well, what about this other stuff? So what we decided to do is try something a little different and build an initiative that would have two parts, a tier one and a tier two, the tier one being totally pure play renewables, wind, solar. In this new mandate, we were still crazy enough to think Harrisburg would pass. 80% of the obligation would have to be met by pure play renewables. But being true to what we heard from folks otherwise left out of a conversation like that, why not a tier two? That's about moving the needle environmentally. What about a tier two? That's about advanced energy technology, if not pure play renewable. Let it in, cap it, let it in. The waste coals, the PFBCs, we thought fuel cells, advanced energy efficiency. Hot dog, we had a formula. We had a formula that began to dial down the tension. But what about the economic piece of the equation? We were starting to crack the nut on the science piece and the participatory decision making but how are the economics going to work such that mandating a whole bunch of wind and solar, and back in the day it wasn't so cheap, was still going to be the economic win, environmental and economic win. Not immediately self-evident. But here was the thinking there. Again, call me crazy, but I was thinking that the legislators in Harrisburg would not or could not be convinced to embrace a mandate that thou shalt use renewable energy just to save the planet. Wasn't California, we weren't Vermont, 
I thought, it's got to be about jobs. It's got to be about jobs. And so off we went around the world finding the biggest manufacturers of renewable energy equipment. And we sat down with those blokes and said, listen, wouldn't you love a shot at one of the biggest electricity markets in the United States? Wouldn't you love to be selling your stuff there? And when we revealed it was Pennsylvania, <laughs> they weren't necessarily thinking this would all work out. But I said, I'll make you a deal. If Pennsylvanians are going to buy renewables, we're going to build renewables. You bring your factories and your plants to Pennsylvania, and we'll get the legislation done that will create the, the needed market. Fast forward about a year. It did take a year. And I'm impatient. Fast forward about a year, and Pennsylvania did become the first major coal producing state in the country to mandate the use of renewable energy. That bill passed, and it passed overwhelmingly. Fast forward that same year, and we had attracted a billion dollars of new investment and 3,000 new jobs, such that fast forward about four years, and lo and behold, not California, not Vermont, Pennsylvania was the number one country uh, state in the, in the East in wind energy jobs, and number three in the United States in solar energy jobs. Now, what about the coal fellas? Were they like, yay, this is the best? <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> Definitely not. But the dialing down of the animosity the, he, the, the, the demonstrative hearing of a perspective and learning about some new technology, they demonstrated their appreciation for that, not by lobbying for the renewable energy bill, but somehow conveniently having to be out of town, getting their hair done, just when the legislation was to be voted on. An exception to the rule, and usually these things just blow up. They're all challenging. But example number two, mercury. Once again, I decide, how about a big vision? Go out there and say, Pennsylvania is going to be a leader in this country in dramatically cutting mercury pollution from coal-fired power plants. All that goodwill <laughs> I had built up in the renewables legislation, we were back to clenched fists and nervous looks. Enter the science, back to the magic formula. This all could have blown up, but coming back to some of those first principles, we looked at a couple things. First and foremost, making the job tougher was the fact that the science says you know, mercury is an acute neurotoxin. You can't be capping and trading mercury, hot spots. You got to cut it, and you got to cut it at its source, and you have to cut it dramatically because mercury is nasty business. Ugh. That makes the job harder. Not to be deterred, I went back to the coal guys, and I'm like, you know, I already sued the Bush administration over their bad rule. We're moving on this. You got to help me out. And we took a little bit deeper dive. And here's what we found on the science. We found that there was a whiz-bang technology, probably old hat to all of you in here, and today it may be old hat, but then it was, it was new stuff for us at DEP. That technology was activated carbon injection technology. Why was that of interest? It was of interest because at the time, and maybe still, it was among the most efficient scrubbers of mercury out of coal-fired power plant flue, ga flue gas. All right, well, that's interesting. How does that get me out of the conundrum that I'm in? 
look a little deeper, and somebody smart like Jay App probably came to the table and said, look at the chemical composition of our coal. And we did. And a funny thing happens when you do that. It turns out that activated carbon injection operates on the basis of grabbing, not mercury, but grabbing the chlorine handle that's otherwise attached to the mercury. Well, for the first time, it became a huge asset that subbituminous coal, the kind we have here, has higher chlorine content than that dreaded competitor coal in the Powder River Basin. So, the tougher we made the mercury standard, the greater claim to market share our coal could have. Hot dog. All right, I'm not going to try to convince you that even with all this, that the coal guys were like, again, thrilled. But I'm still alive. <laughs> and we were, in fact, the first coal state to uh, fully pass and put in place uh, a, a regulation requiring the on-site reduction of mercury to the tune of 90% plus. Stepping back from all of that, I will uh, admit that some of that um, all derives, first and foremost, always a great team, a little Irish luck, a very lucky coincidence that I happen to love Johnny Cash and a cold beer. And that combination has broken through many a log jam. A couple cold beers, maybe. But here's the point. As I think of, with a lot of people's help, how we were able to unlock some pretty tough situations and move the needle, not solving everything, but moving the needle. The progress on the environmental side, huge. The fact that we would find a way to build and boost the economy at the same time, great. But what was most important to me, most important to me, was that gobbledygook of participatory decision making. It was about people. It was about people and bringing out the integrity, the goodwill, the ideas and insights of people who otherwise think they got nothing in common. And I'm going to stop on that note because I think unless and until this country reclaims that, we could see this country stop. And a time really has come when we recognize once again that diversity is our strength and it is in bringing the variety of perspective and insight together and to the table. There is no problem, including climate change, that we can't solve. And Carl is going to tell you how we're going to do that. <laughs> All right, buddy, you're up. We're going to hold, we're going to hold questions until Carl's done, and then we'll uh, jump on it. Okay. Katie, Katie has set up uh, quite an expectation that I will utterly fail to meet, I believe, uh, having uh, worked in this, in this field for, for 30 years. Uh, obviously, collectively, the climate policy community has not applied the magic sauce and the magic formulas that you described, though we, though we have tried. Uh, I'm going to whip through some slides fairly, fairly quickly, focusing on the challenges of climate change and the kind of bridges, a key bridge uh, that um, uh, that we that, that we have to build within the climate policy community. Uh, I'm going to share my PowerPoint, and there's links to the studies that I'm going to whip through. I know this is a fairly informed audience, so I'm going to move uh, fa fairly fast through this. Uh, I'm going to talk about the problem at hand, uh, the three challenging tasks needed to transform our energy system to 100% clean. I'm going to talk about those who are advocating 100% renewable pathways to get to 100% clean, why they have such wide support, some of the implications and challenges in building bridges between sort of the 100% clean advocates and the 100% renewable advocates. Uh, so let's, let's jump right in. Uh, probably many people in this room have looked at the IPCC 1.5 uh, degrees report and you are aware of the challenge head, whether we limit warming to 1.5 or to 2 degrees, we have to get on the, uh, an incredibly steep slope of reductions over the next 30 years. It's kind of the inverse of man's hockey stick 
uh, that we, we have to drop emissions. And of course, this is a six gas problem, not just CO2. We gotta work on methane, we gotta work on N2O, uh, the fluorinated gases, as well as get, bring down black carbon emissions. Of course, the biggest part of the game is CO2, and I'm gonna focus on CO2 uh, and the energy sector. For those of you who looked at the IPCC report, you'll know that they uh, charted four pathways to get to uh, to 1.5 to keep uh, at 1.5 degrees or less, uh, and three of the four uh, require us to have uh, negative emissions by by mid-century through uh, changes in uh, uh, agriculture, forestry, land use, uh, and or they also had a. a primarily model the use of bioenergy with carbon capture as a way to pull CO2 out of the atmosphere. Uh, there's also, of course, the possibility of direct air capture and maybe other technologies and processes that, that we can't even imagine right now. But let's face it, it's, there's a very good likelihood of overshoot uh, of atmospheric levels, and we're, probably, we're gonna have to come up with ways to remove CO2 from the atmosphere by, by mid-century. That alone provides an important rationale for developing carbon capture technology now and get it ready, get the technology ready, commercialize, cost down, legal and regulatory uh, structures. That's an important thought to preserve as we, uh, as we go forward. It's a challenging task in the energy sector, but it really boils down to three things <coughs> consistent across all, all the modeling uh, that I've looked at and conducted. How do we get there? And this is, this is a graphic from the Risky Business Report uh, that I urge you to look at if, if you haven't seen it. Uh, the first is we have to be really energy efficient. Uh, we have to drop uh, energy use per dollar GDP by two thirds or more over, over the next 30 years. That's sort of strategy number one. Strategy number two is we have to switch from the direct combustion of fossil fuels to the use of electricity or electricity derived fuels across as many end uses as we possibly can. Uh, and if we do that by 2050, we can increase the share of electricity, electricity-derived fuels from current level about 23% up to 51% or perhaps more. If we're gonna do that, of course, electric electricity demand is gonna increase. We have to, of course, decarbonize uh, the production of electricity. <coughs> Unfortunately, there's a lot of technologies that can do that, a whole panoply of renewable technologies, some of which uh, the, the costs have dropped dramatically recently. We have nuclear, we have carbon capture, uh, and again, perhaps even uh, things that yet, yet to be invented. But we have a lot of choices, and we know that we can take uh, the electricity intensity, the, the emission intensity of electricity production close to zero over the next 30 years uh, through a combination of technologies. So, the problem is very daunting, but technologically we know how to do it. It's a matter of getting the economics right with further RD&D and the political will to put the policies in place to do that. Um, when we look at that, that middle strategy, the decarbonization of electricity, um, uh, and when we look at the mainstream modeling of, uh, of how to get there, uh, I've put on the, on the screen here four studies the Obama Mid-Century Strategy uh, Report, uh, released uh, in late in 2016. The Risky Business Report also released in late 2016. I think it was November, December for both. Both kind of landed with a thud because there was some other stuff going on in late, uh, late 2016 that seemed to capture all the oxygen uh, in the room. Uh, there was also an NRDC study that came out in 2017 uh, that modeled uh, pathways to 80% uh, or greater reductions in the energy sector, and a Union of Concerned Scientists study that came out in 2016 that modeled deep reductions, 80% or more, in power generation. <laughs> if you stack these all up, all they have a similar, uh, uh, a similar message, a similar conclusion, that we can dramatically reduce emissions in the power sector and take advantage of the cost drops in wind and solar as, uh, and have them supply maybe 50, 60, 75 percent of total generation. But that needs to be complemented with some baseload technologies, some dispatchable technologies, and all four of these studies have slabs still in, this, in the system of nuclear 
and carbon, ca and carbon capture. The main uh, a rule of thumb, when, whether you talk to analysts at NREL or EPRI or in academia, you know, 93, 95, 97% of analysts understand that when you try to go beyond about 80% variable renewable energy, like electricity generation, you get onto a very steep nonlinear part of the cost curve. And that's an, that's an important fact. There's all the sites for those who are not familiar with these, with these studies. There's a similar conclusion if we go back to the IPCC report looking globally, past one, two, three, and four, and also stacked up against uh, modeling by the International Energy Agency. When they look at decarbonizing the power sector, I know you can't read all this, go to the original source and know that in their scenarios, they still retain slabs of nuclear, fossil with CCS, you know, biomass with CCS, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, you have a major role for wind and solar. But the IPCC does not believe you can get there with renewables alone. Nonetheless, there is a lot of wide public support, a lot of powerful stakeholders and NGOs that are advocating 100% renewables. Uh, you have companies banded together in the RE100 group that are saying, we're going to purchase nothing but renewable electricity. Uh, you have mayors. Uh, saying our town is going to be 100% renewable or even we're going to try to move my local economy to 100% renewable generation. You have states moving in this direction. <coughs> Hawaii actually enacted a law mandating 100% renewables by 2045. And many of you are probably familiar with the recently uh, uh, enacted SB 100 in, in California, which actually interestingly started out as a 100% renewable mandate as first introduced but fairly quickly, the authors changed it to 100% zero carbon by 2045, though they have strong escalating uh, uh, strengthening of the renewable mandates up to 60% by 2030. But this is a very important data point in the political landscape that California did not go all the way to 100% renewable. We have several newly elected governors talking 100% renewables. That's another thing to watch too in the political landscape. Uh, one of the touchstone studies that supports people advocating this, of course, is the work of Mark Jacobson uh, that uh, has uh, he's done several publications over, over recent years. Uh, and also, he uh, suffered a fairly withering critique published in 2017 by 20 leading experts, I believe four of which are at Carnegie Mellon, uh, to play to the hometown crowd here for, for, for a moment. Uh, that found some very serious flaws in the analysis, some very uh, out there assumptions on, on what could be done uh, by trying to rely on 100% wind, solar, and hydro, i.e. water for that. Sadly, in this whole political landscape, Jacobson's response was to sue the lead author of this study and to sue the NAS for publishing this critique. Fortunately, lawsuits later too. But that's, I think, just one illustration of the very hot emotions that are driven by, by this split between 100% clean, zero carbon, versus 100% renewable. This issue has really come back to the fore just in the, in the last couple months in the wake of the November uh, midterms. Uh, we have uh, uh, ideas for a Green New Deal being, being put forth that call for 100% renewables by 2035. No nuclear, no carbon capture, no bioenergy, no waste to energy, and even they say sort of low, no large hydro. I'm not sure if they're saying no more additional large hydro. Hopefully, they're not gonna tear down uh, uh, Grand Coulee. Uh, phase out of all fossil fuels over time. Uh, a, a phrase in, in a, a letter to, to Congress that says we oppose market-based mechanisms specifically calling out cap and trade. Not sure if that applies to carbon taxes as well. So there's both sort of technology uh, pieces here as well as, as policy pieces. Uh, this letter went up, uh, 600 plus environmental groups signed it. Some of them are quite small and splinter groups, but there's a sizable number of, main, of major environmental groups like 350.org, Greenpeace, Center for Biological Diversity, uh, Friends of the Earth putting uh, a stake in the ground here and you know, also you know, 
sitting and uh, doing the sit-in at Pelosi's office uh, earlier in the month. Uh, interestingly, sort of the mainstream green group uh, members, uh, Sierra Club, NRDC, EDF, NWF, Nature Conservancy, Institute of Scientists, they, they, did not, they did not sign this, and I think they are positioning themselves in a somewhat uh, diff different space. But the th key thing that serious, peop serious uh, people who are concerned about climate change you need to acknowledge this is what, a, there's a lot of grassroots support for 100% renewables, and uh, I believe that we need to build bridges uh, to that important source of grassroots activism. Why not go with 100% renewables? Uh, I'll, I'll whip through some, some quick analysis here before we turn, turn to the discussion. Again, probably many of the people in the room know the basics here. Um, the cost of wind and solar on an LCOE basis, levelized cost of energy, has dramatically declined. And this is great news. And this is why mainstream modelers can envision power systems with 50, 60, 70, 80% solar and wind in the future. Uh, so we've seen those, those dramatic uh, reductions. Uh, but it's important to know and keep firmly in mind the limitations of the metric called levelized cost of energy. You can't build a power system based on the levelized cost of energy. Uh, this is a graphic from an interesting study put out by John Platt at Google. Uh, and he does this sort of interesting, just kind of thought, thought experiment of saying, what if, what if we uh, took a power system and tried to build it entirely with solar power, or entirely with wind, or entirely with natural gas combined cycle, or entirely with nuclear power. And this is kind of a range of four to eight cents a kilowatt hour for solar. Maybe it's actually, because this study is a couple years old, let's just say, let's say it's four cents or three cents or whatever your levelized cost of solar unsubs unsubsidized is. You can add it to a system that has you know, just a fraction of, of solar, you know, and, and a total fraction of solar or, or the uh, renewable goes up to one, 100% out here. But as you add more solar, the cost does not say, stay the same. The total system cost of integrating that intermittent source goes nonlinear <coughs> at some point because it can only generate power 12 hours a day, sometimes a little less, sometimes a little more, depending on the season. The same thing with wind. You can add it to a power system at four cents or five cents or six cents on an LCO basis now because total variable generation is less than 10% of the total right now. And with wind, because of its pattern of generation, you can add it and, and the, the, the total system cost would stay relatively the same, but at some point, the variable nature and the integration costs start to go nonlinear in this hypothetical all wind system. Not surprisingly, natural gas with CCS, a fairly dispatchable, controllable source, you can uh, you could build an entire system of that with that and, and cost would stay relatively flat. So that's kind of the, the hypothetical thought experiment in the John Platt paper. Uh, then in kind of a more realistic sense, he says, what if I blend solar and wind and throw in some storage and what would that what would that look like at low levels of penetration? What would that look like at 100% penetration? And even with some of the complementarity of solar and wind, and then throwing in uh, your, your storage, at some point costs go nonlinear. And that's why, again, mainstream modeling does not try, does, does not credibly try to put out 100% uh, renewable scenarios. Why, why is that? What are, what, are some, what are some of the actually the underlying physics of that? I've pulled two graphs here from, J from Jacobson's work. Uh, here is his simulations of two days of generation of an all solar and, solar and wind system. And you can see that there's the green photovoltaic production that just has the two camel's humps over two days. And this is, by the way, a, a giant national system, seamless transmission, uh, tons of solar and wind everywhere across the country. Uh, again, a rather optimistic case. And, and here's kind of a, a daily cycle of some wind generation. Kind of much more variable, unpredictable. And then the red line is how they <coughs> stack up together, also with a little bit of solar, solar thermal production. You know, that's, that's a daily cycle, and you can imagine 
okay, well maybe we can just fill in all this with batteries or thermal storage or something. And if you did that um, over the course of a year, yeah, yeah, it would cost something, but at least you'd be using that solar thermal, that, that storage uh, in batteries or thermal sources every day. Whatever investment you did, you would be, you'd be cycling it, you'd be getting a lot out of your money. But that's not the only source of variability, the daily source. There's also uh, seasonal, seasonal sources, and here's Jacobson's mo uh, modeling of his whole six year period uh, and how solar generation peaks every summer, bottoms out to every winter, peaks every summer, on and on for, for six years. Wind has a somewhat complementary pattern, uh, tending, to, uh, tending to peak uh, in, the, um, uh, in the spring and summer and drop off in the fall uh, and winter. Uh, you add those together and you still have a serious seasonal variation in a 100% renewable system. What do you do with these troughs? How much you know, how much storage do you build to cover those intervening months? Or do you overbuild the system so much to cover, to cover the troughs that then what do you do with all the, all the, sur all the surplus generation, sometimes called curtailment? And so I've talked about daily seasonal, and then there's the uh-ohs, just the stochastic variation in solar and wind output that we're gonna hit, that Germany hits called the Doppelflaute, when they just get hours or even days of very low production because of cloudiness and, and low wind situations. Those, those, that's the variability that becomes less and less frequent in the daily solar cycle that you have to make massive capital investments used only occasionally. That's what drives your, your, your nonlinear uh, uh, troughs. So to kind of, to, uh, and then to kind of recap, what you need to do in a 100% renewable scenario, you have to integrate, do the variability. You can do some geographic aggravation, uh, aggregation through transmission system expansion, load shifting and demand response, move the demand to when the variable power is produced, storage, uh, and ultimately maybe dispatchable generation using hydrogen, synthetic methane, or biogas. All these have interesting obstacles. Transmission is great, it's a fairly cheap way to get more integration and more uh, reliable power supplies, really the obstacles are just balkanized decision making in the US uh, and NIMBYism. People don't want transmission lines in their backyard. The load shifting challenge, when you look at Jacobson's modeling and some other modeling, massive shifting of load is assumed far beyond anything we've achieved to date. Uh, ratios of flexible load to inflexible load of three to one or more. Uh, that's unknown, uncharted territory. Storage challenge, we know the storage can take many forms. We know that batteries are beginning to make inroads, but they're typically doing short power bursts to maintain, maintain frequency response. Uh, we can imagine sort of hours of power to balance the variable output uh, on that day-to-day -day cycle, but ultimately we will need weekly, monthly, seasonal storage of renewable generation to cover up to weeks of total generation. That's what Jacobson models. That's what a guy named Becker models, uh, uh, looking for eight, eight, 12, 16 weeks of power storage. It's expensive. Even if, uh, th this is a study that came out last year by Shainer and Caldera and, and others, uh, they assume that we can get our battery costs down or other storage costs down to $100 a kilowatt hour. Currently, they're three, 400 uh, kilowatt, uh, kilowatt hour. 12 hours alone, on, you know, trying to complement the daily cycle would cost $530 billion if we get it down to $100 a kilowatt hour. If we try, we, they ran numbers on three weeks of storage, $23 trillion. That's that nonlinear part of the cost curve that I don't think we want to uh, explore. How do we bridge these divides? This, this I had to grab this screenshot just from a couple days ago. Uh, Dave Roberts, a very, I think, uh, cogent observer in Vox.com, says a smart political move is leave the question of what counts as clean energy as open as possible. And it's interesting, you'll, you'll, you'll see this in, in public statements by people on different sides of the spectrum Sometimes just saying let's let's not let's not define clean 
really lock it down yet. Let's let's let uh, uh, let there be some some ambiguity on it. I, I would go a, a little bit further than that and say some some messages and uh, that 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 I that I take to advocates of 100% renewables is if you look at 100% renewable purchasing by a company, by an individual, by a city, uh, that that's just an incremental boost to demand to renewable energy right now. Let, let's go full bore on that. We're only at about eight or nine percent variable renewable energy right now. That, that can grow, uh, but it's a very different story to say a 100% renewable requirement on the supply side for a state, for a city, for a country. You get that on a certain timeline, you're, you're gonna hit uh, you know, the kind of reliability and cost issues uh, that I've raised. Overall, what we really need is a broad portfolio of zero carbon options. We need to think about this as a risk management issue and not bet all of our chips on just a narrow range of technologies. We need to spread our chips in the R&D &D world. Um, we need to be investing in, yes, cheaper renewables, cheaper storage, push the limits on load shifting and the whole suite of smart grid uh, technologies. Uh, we need to be looking ahead to how we could produce hydrogen, synthetic gas, uh, biogas from cheap renewables. Uh, perhaps uh, what, if we overbuild, uh, how can we make better use of curtailed uh, uh, renewables production? Carbon capture, we really, we absolutely need to commercialize this. And I'm, I'm happy to see that more and more mainstream green groups are joining uh, something called the Carbon Capture Coalition or, or signaling some receptivity to this. We need to commercialize it because we need to be doing carbon dioxide removal by mid-century. Also, there's certain industrial sources that are gonna need it uh, regardless of what we do in the power sector. Um, so we, we need a strong RD&D agenda there and we need a strong RD&D agenda on nuclear. Uh, right now, it seems that the U.S. just cannot build uh, a reactor at reasonable cost, yet we know that the South Koreans can do it. So what's, what's the problem? We need, uh, we need to advance small modular nuclear designs. We need to um, uh, make this a viable option, as well as uh, ensure that if a reactor is safe, an existing reactor is safe and has a rel you know, reasonable operating cost, keep it online even though our electricity market designs seem to be pushing it off, which is a whole two-hour lecture on what, why that's happening. And I think we can also uh, build, build bridges across the entire policy community by focusing on ways to build transmission lines. Regardless of whether, of whether we're 80% renewable or if we might someday get to 100% renewable, we need to be able to wheel power from <laughs> offshore to the load centers giant wind resources in the Great Plains to the load centers, rich solar resources in the southwest to the load sources. Right now, we can't do it. And that will be critical no matter what. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop there, uh, appreciate it, and again, uh, happy to talk uh, in this Q&A and, and afterwards, and you'll have all the citations for the studies. So now, these two. Okay. okay, so now these two folks are going to sit up here, and the uh, idea I think I want to start is uh, with a question from the audience to see if, uh, if we can get some dialogue going. Otherwise, I have a whole list of things I could, I could ask as well. So please, David. Thank you both for very uh, thought-provoking comments. Uh, neither of you. I don't think either of you mentioned the word regulation. And you've both been around as the environment around energy and environment regulation has evolved. Uh, many quarters it's a dirty word today. Uh, with the exception of the Toxic Substances Control Act, we haven't seen major environmental legislation in a very long time. Can I get each of you to talk about the changing landscape for getting the actions that Carl, you described in this changing milieu? 
Well, I would just uh, thank you for the question. I would start by saying. Uh, make no mistake, the uh, renewable or the advanced energy portfolio standard was a regulation. It was a mandate that thou shalt use renewable energy. And that mercury uh, rule was a regulation. Um, Look, I, I think we have to put right on the table, among the distressing developments um, in our country is the fact that facts don't matter and the whole alternative fact um, apostasy is, um, up, you know, is upon us. And a lot of what I put forward becomes a heck of a lot more challenging when you can bring all the science or technology to the fore that you want and you know, nobody cares or, or people envision other. Um, however, I, I, do, I do think a couple things are true. Um, we have at the, at the highest levels the very disconcerting um, uh, paradigms like that. But you still do see at a state level uh, change happening and happening in a positive direction. You still do see uh, you know, each of these companies is developing its own internal regulations and building that scientific and economic case that enables them to do that absolutely not at the scale that the ticking clock that we have um, needs. But it does say to me that um, there is still room for thoughtful, informed regulation to move forward. And the last thing I'll just say in terms of the dirty word business, that itself is a flight from fact to, fan to fancy. Uh, the, the examples are replete, I shared too, uh, where Thoughtful regulation itself drives significant economic opportunity and upside. Uh, and the last, last thing I would just say is in my new um, environmental mission in the oceans space, I will tell you the biggest single innovation that has begun to restore and save fisheries in this country and around the world was giving fishermen an economic slice of the pie so that they were not incented to go out on Monday and vacuum up as much fish as they could because they owned it, they stored it, they husbanded it, and we have had fisheries come back from the brink of collapse by regulation. Yeah, great, great question. Uh, I think one of the saddest things that has happened uh, over my policy lifetime is to see the incredible success of the SO2 trading system in, in 1990 um, then get tarnished by the, uh, the collapse of the Waxman-Markey bill in, in 2010 and sort of giving a bad name to a key market mechanism, cap and trade. Um, uh, the good news is I think there is, a, there is growing support for using carbon tax, carbon taxes as kind of a foundational policy that we're going to need to drive the decarbonization of the economy. And there's a, a very significant uh, op-ed in the Wall Street Journal I think either just popped today or is, is popping uh, this week in terms of uh, uh, advocating uh, for that. The, nonetheless, even with a, with a, a cap and trade system or, or carbon, carbon taxes, uh, I strongly believe that you need to complement that with sensible regulations. Because there's, there's just a, some sources that you just cannot uh, bring, under, bring them under that umbrella. So the uh, the, the calls from, you know, there's, there's some, I think, in the business community particularly say, maybe I would take a support a carbon tax if you got rid of all regulations. I'm like, that's, that's, a, that's a fantasy world, you know, or, or, you know, all carbon dioxide related regulations. You know, you, you need, you, if, if, you have, if you have a nail, get a hammer, you know, maybe a carbon tax, if you have a, a screw, get a screwdriver. Maybe you need a regulation on this, on this source because it is not amenable to you know, measuring the affluent and taxing associated. Right. Uh, before I take another question, a quick follow on, and this, you both have had a great deal of experience at both these levels, and I'm curious which one or both or how to mix them work together. That's the state versus the federal level. They have very different decision processes. The one is obviously regional by nature, the other is not. Um, and since our use of, of power and energy is incredibly differentiated by location, is this a federal game or not? Or is there, are we missing something between the two that would help this dialogue? Mm -hmm. uh, I would say it, it is, uh, it, it is a incredibly balkanized set of decisions. <laughs> Again, yeah. Federal, state, 
local, and, that, and we also have these players called RTOs, that their policies, their market designs also have an impact. We have state collaborations like Reggie. Uh, so talk about a complex tapestry. I, I think ideally there are, there are things done best at the federal level and the state and the local level. And it's also very encouraging to see how many mayors are really stepping up and trying to be active in the climate change and the climate change arena. And you know, whether it's building codes, enforcement of building codes, urban planning, uh, uh, that you know, there's a whole piece of this best tailored at the local level, and there's some things best tailored at the, the state level. Well, I would just say that sometimes that. I would love to have lots of decisions made at the state level. <laughs> well, um, sometimes um, that that inelegance. Of, um, of the regulations coming from a state-by-state -state, uh, level actually turns out to be pretty convenient because when you then want to make the economic case that, geez, wouldn't a comprehensive regulation be swell, that balkanization adds up to a lot of cost, a lot of uncertainty, and when you can then make the case that a, uh, uh, a uh, more comprehensive initiative is, is preferred, that can help you. I guess I would just say this by way of um, uh, it, it, getting a, off a little bit the rosy scenario train, which is even in the, the best of times um, when uh, you know, Andrew McElwain uh, was, was on Capitol Hill with, with just terrific leaders like Senator John Hines um, and there was thoughtfulness in policy making and dialogue, um, even in those times, Washington's definition of leadership usually was followership or we were in a crisis. And either stuff had come up from the states such that the leadership at the federal level was kind of like, okay, two thirds of the country's already doing it, we could just put our imprimatur on there. Not always, but often. And there's, in some respects, there's nothing wrong with that. The old adage about the states being the laboratories of democracy. Either that or the crisis scenario. Um, the crisis scenario where, for example, you might ask regulation, new law, how was it in the aftermath of the Gingrich Revolution, the contract on America, <laughs> um, how was it that that manifesto, which said every regulation is a bad regulation, there shall be no more regulations. It was in the aftermath of the Gingrich, Gingrich takeover of the Congress in 1994. It was after that that we got done, first time in a long time, major upgrade to the Safe Drinking Water Act, a major upgrade to the Food Safety Act. I would like to say that it was all because enlightened minds prevailed. But it was because we wound up with a cryptosporidium crisis in the Midwest that killed scores and scores of people. And we wound up with an E. coli in hamburgers crisis that was killing kids. And I'd also like to say that as soon as that happened, by golly, Newt Gingrich changed his opinion about regulations and we got these laws done. Uh, but as a tip of the hat 25 years ago to some brave families, it wasn't that at all. When persuasion failed, Hello, Mrs. Smith. Would you do this country a service and fly to Washington and stand outside Newt Gingrich's door and call shame on this Congress unless and until they act so that another child doesn't die from a contaminated hamburger like your kid did? And Mrs. Smith did. And it was those voices that ultimately reminded people, hmm, do I have a conscience? Maybe we should do something. Uh, so anyway, usually Washington even in good days, the leadership is a little bit of a different kind of flavor. Thank you. We have time for maybe two more questions. Uh, yeah. So you guys talked about regulations and carbon taxes, potential solution options for uh, moving the economy towards renewable energies. And you also talked about the Green New Deal. Now, uh, I believe one of the major components of all these Green New Deal proposals is a sort of massive federal mobilization on the scale of like World War II, and along with that, a federal jobs program. Uh, how do you see, 
perhaps like direct uh, public employment fitting into the solution pie, I guess. Yeah. The elements, first of all, the, the, the Green New Deal, as you probably know right now, is kind of a giant inkblot. Right. I mean, people read different things into it and have diff different visions, and it's going to be really interesting to see how that plays out over, over, over the next uh, two years uh, or and, and beyond. Um, in terms of the elements of it that I've seen from different different components, I don't see anything contradictory with carbon taxes uh, or or regulatory approaches. But it, it is the you know large infrastructure programs, large R D and D spending, uh, and also uh, using revenue sources to ensure a just transition for uh, you know for fossil fuel dependent communities. So in a sense, uh, I, I, I welcome the discussion and putting additional things on the table because often sort of in the climate policy wonk world, you know, frankly, there has not been enough thinking about the just transition to the clean, the clean energy system. So uh, I think I don't see any basic incompatibilities uh, and it will be just absolutely fascinating to see, you know, what, what ideas uh, take root and, and draw support. Talking about infrastructure, and those are good jobs. Yes. Um, I'm a lot of MBA student, so I've totally understood everything you've talked about so far. Um, <laughs> I was wondering if you could give me kind of more of a. Um, oh, hello. Thank you. How's that? Um, taking a little bit more of like a political economy view on this, um, one thing I've read about a bit is the connection between the capitalism and the environment. And um, people like Elizabeth Warren are, and uh, a lot of the more liberal wing of the Democratic Party are pushing for structural changes to capitalism as we know it today. And I'm wondering if you could comment on how you see that it, whether or not you see that as kind of a viable solution in terms of businesses being able to make longer term decisions as opposed to freaking out about earnings calls. Um, and if you could also comment on the efficacy of like consumer movements in, uh, I'm sorry, thanks, student kids, but, uh, in um, actually having an effect of getting businesses to make the right environmental decision as opposed to kind of just focusing on the supply side of things. Uh, I'll, I'll start up with one comment, I think, to remain to what uh, you said, which is, I think there's been a strain of thought uh, among some, uh, some left-wing writers for, for many years that we can't solve the climate change problem unless we, you know, abandon capitalism. Uh, you know, they're, they're, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's, you know, the, the core of the, the core of the problem. And I just think, just look at, just look at the history of the behavior of socialist or, or communist countries. They have always been lagging on the environment. There's nothing inherently protective of the environment in alternatives to capitalism, meaning the mixed economy that we see in Europe and the US and other OECD countries. So I don't, I don't believe that there is something you know, fundamental that has to change about, about our mixed economy in order to solve this. But uh, again, if solving climate change is totally separable from you know legitimate uh, questions that have been raised, particularly in the wake of the in the wake of the 2008 recession, about kind of you know how do we how do we ensure uh, the continuation of safety nets? Uh, how do we uh, uh, how do how do we create jobs, et cetera, uh, et cetera? But I don't think, uh, and and I don't think that a a massive that there's going to be any massive surge in uh, thinking about restructuring the whole economy to solve climate change. We need, we need the best elements of capitalism to solve this. We need uh, a, a, health, a healthy economy generating a lot of in investment dollars and generating a lot of innovation. And we, we know what kind of economic system can produce that. So I would just say that I, I, I think that the environmental and the economic challenges that we have right now are most demonstrative of um, those activities have perverted the capitalist system. The idea that the pollution that Carl demonstrated goes totally uncharged, 
That's not capitalism. That that's a, a massive failure failure in a market based system. A make market based system needs to be an informed system. Um, and you know, just my two cents. That I, I think it is a distortion of capitalism when the um, CEO C suite is now earning 400 times what the average worker earns when 20 or 30 years ago um, that was 30 times. So uh, there's something that has gotten distorted there and for my money it's not the pure working of the market. Somebody put their thumb on the scale. I'd love to get back to real capitalism actually. Um, the, the, I, I want to take advantage of the last half of your, the second part of your question though potentially to toss out a, uh, a research project or a thought experiment. So there are people in this room who were intimately involved with something called Project 88. Project 88 represented, I think, some of the first and in some respects last major innovations in environmental thinking. Because what happened in Project 88 is Yes, economics was relevant to in things environmental, but it was relevant only in an ancillary way. Here's the environmental regulation. Here is the cost benefit analysis. Here's the price tag. So totally ancillary. Project 88 was, economics is a hugely impactful <coughs> discipline. Can't we bring it into the interstices, make it integral to the environmental tool itself, not ancillary. And thus was born acid rain, cat shares program, saving fisheries, maybe cap and trade, etc. We haven't had that kind of innovation. Where am I going with this? You talk about consumer movement. So I've been playing around in my head with what is a new set of disciplines that right now is either totally not related to the environmental space or at best is ancillary. So I want a new press guy for my oceans work so we can get our message out. That's ancillary to what we're actually doing. What if we thought about human-centered design, digitization, social media, and figured out how to bring that into the interstices of the environmental initiative itself so that we could massively expand the reach and impact of an environmental tool just like the last chapter of this kind of thinking bringing the economics into it vastly accelerated the environmental tool itself i don't know how to do that but i would surely love the kind of brain power around here to help think about something like that. Thank you. Well, well you heard her, folks. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think it's worth it. Well, it's been a, a great pleasure to have you. I'd like to thank all of the Scott Institute folks who helped organize this. I love, thank you guys very much for coming. It's lovely to have you. Thank you for serving on the Scott Institute Advisory uh, Board. Really appreciate it. And Katie, uh, she sat back on after her uh, hiatus and, and the, her political uh, uh, field trip that she took. Uh, I have that one last softball question. Do you guys do this very often? Do you, do you work together either uh, on the side or you know, come do this in the we, public? Before? We haven't shared a stage since we both took a, a year uh, senior fellowship at the India's leading energy research institute exactly 20 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> And it was such a bad experience, I haven't wanted to share it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're glad, we're glad oh, to oh, make a... Uh, He's well, walking home. <laughs> well, we'll have you back in 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> you can do it again. Thank you so much again. And, uh,